Wars between the two most populated countries are few and far between, but overshadowed by the Cuban Missile Crisis, a fierce conflict raged silently between two Asian giants. It was a clash that reverberated through the majestic peaks of the Himalayas, yet its echoes were muffled by the grand narratives of global history. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today we'll unveil the forgotten storm that shook the foundations of the East, the Sino-Indian War of 1962. As many post-colonial border disputes normally do, this one begins with the British. The British and China's Qing Dynasty had disagreements about where exactly both of their dominions ended. Given that the border was located on the incredibly hard to access Himalayan range, it was hard to come to an agreement. The disagreement was compounded by the fact that it was Tibet and not China proper which bordered British India, and Tibet, while de facto independent, was a Chinese vassal. The British would impose their border, the Ardag Johnson Line, on the Tibetans, without negotiating with the Qing. Nonetheless, the Qing accepted the borders for several decades. Things remained the same until the late 1800s, when the great game between Russia and Britain was at its climax. To prevent their empires from stepping on each other's toes, the British decided to draw a new line, the mccartney macdonald Line, which would put the region of Aksai Chin under Qing rule. The British would present the offer to Peking, but the Qing never responded to it. In the East, decades later, things would develop similarly, with the British imposing yet another line, the McMahon Line, on the Tibetans. Once again, the Chinese were not invited. This deadlock would remain until India's independence. The Indians would inherit their colonizers' disputes, with the independence of Pakistan further complicating things. Still, while Pakistan and India never enjoyed good relations with each other, the same could not be said for India and China. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's Prime Minister and a major proponent of the Cold War's non-aligned movement, wanted good relations with China, hoping to establish an Asian axis to act as a counterbalance to the Soviet and American blocs. In the West, the Indians recognized the Johnson Line as the border, as opposed to the Chinese who recognized the McDonald Line. Furthermore, in the East, the Chinese rejected the McMahon Line, claiming most of the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh. The Chinese took the position that the Tibetan government should not have been allowed to make such a treaty, rejecting Tibet's claims of independent rule. Things would deteriorate rapidly after the Chinese annexed Tibet, eliminating the pseudo-buffer state between the two Goliaths. In 1956 to 1957, China constructed a road through Aksai Chin, connecting Xinjiang and Tibet that ran south of the Johnson Line in many places. The Indians did not learn of this until the road was already completed and Nehru was enraged. While China was posturing abroad, things were not as stable within. Tibetan guerrillas continued to fight their rule, and soon they garnered support from the CIA. This movement eventually ended in a massive uprising in 1959, which the Chinese violently put down. But the Dalai Lama managed to escape, being offered asylum in India. This offer of asylum led to a series of violent border skirmishes between India and China. But both nations kept proposing diplomatic settlements from 1960 to 1962, although to no avail. In response, the Indians established the Forward Policy, establishing advanced posts in disputed areas. The Indians also began requesting military aid from the West to counter the Chinese. The request was denied, as the US thought that the Indians were too soft on communism. Ironically enough, this led the Indians to ask the Soviets for military aid, who, having recently fallen out with the Chinese, agreed. 
Studies have shown that a good night's rest improves mood, memory, engagement, and performance, important elements for effective leadership and decision-making. That's why I'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Beam. Beam's Dream Powder is a delicious hot cocoa for bedtime that is clinically shown to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed with no grogginess. Dream Powder contains ingredients such as L-theanine, magnesium, melatonin, nano-CBD, and reishi to help you relax. And it comes in different flavors and potencies so you can customize it for your lifestyle. It tastes like a delicious nighttime hot chocolate, contains no added sugar, and is only 15 calories. Running a media company can be stressful, but Dream Powder helps me get a great night's sleep, allowing me to feel focused, decisive, and ready for my workday. Support our channel, click on the link in the description, and use my code ARMCHAIRHISTORY to get 35% off of your first order when you subscribe, and then 20% off of all followers orders. Plus, when you subscribe to Dream Powder, you will receive a free frother with your first order. You can pause, skip, or cancel at any time, so there's no risk. Likely influenced by India's invasion of Portuguese Goa, the Chinese resolved that diplomacy was not going to resolve anything and resumed previously banned forward patrols after April 30th, 1962. Chairman Mao Zedong commented, Nehru wants to move forward, and we won't let him. Originally, we tried to guard against this, but now it seems we cannot prevent it. If he wants to advance, we might as well adopt armed coexistence. You wave a gun, and I'll wave a gun. We'll stand face to face, and can each practice our courage. Various border conflicts between India and China flared up throughout the summer and autumn of 1962. In June, a skirmish caused the death of a dozen Chinese troops. On July 22nd, the Ford policy was extended to allow Indian troops to push back Chinese troops already established in the disputed territory. Commanders were now given the discretion to open fire upon Chinese forces if threatened. Nonetheless, the Indians were confident that a war would not be triggered and made little preparations. India had only two divisions of troops in the region of the conflict. Even in September 1962, when Indian troops were ordered to expel the Chinese from Thogla Ridge, Major General J.S. Dillon expressed that a few rounds fired at the Chinese would cause them to run away. As a result, when around a thousand Chinese surrounded a patrol of 50 Indians at Yum Sola on October 10th, the Indians were in no position to respond. The patrol surprisingly managed to defeat the first Chinese assault, but were eventually defeated. Both sides suffered dozens of casualties, but things could have been worse, as the Chinese held their fire while Indians retreated and even buried the Indian dead with military honors. The attack was the heaviest fighting to this point, and made it clear that the Chinese were preparing for an offensive. But six days later, the Cuban Missile Crisis kicked off and garnered the world's attention, shielded by a distraction that would likely keep both the US and Soviet Union at bay, the Chinese decided to attack, and on October 20th, 1962, thousands of Chinese troops attacked Indian positions in both the east and western borders. In the east, the People's Liberation Army sought to capture both banks of Namka Chu River. Indian forces were undermanned and ill-equipped, with only an understrength battalion to support them, while the Chinese troops had three regiments positioned on the north side of the river. The Indians expected Chinese forces to cross via one of five bridges over the river and defended those crossings. The PLA bypassed the defenders by fording the river, which was shallow at that time of year, instead. The Chinese launched a surprise attack and overwhelmed the Indian troops, which prompted their withdrawal from Namka Chu. Fearful of continued losses, Indian troops retreated into Bhutan, and the Chinese respected the border and did not pursue. After four days of fierce fighting, the Chinese succeeded in securing a substantial portion of the disputed territory. In the west, 40,000 Chinese had crossed into Aksai Chin, where only several thousand Indian troops were garrisoned. The communists already controlled most of the disputed territory, and late on October 19th, launched several attacks on Indian positions. By October 22nd, all posts north of Chushul had been cleared. After realizing the magnitude of the attack, the Indian Western Command withdrew many of the isolated outposts to the southeast. 
By October 24th, China had a strong diplomatic position, with the majority of Chinese forces having advanced almost 10 miles south of the control line before the conflict. Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai ordered the troops to stop advancing and attempted to negotiate with Nehru as Indian forces retreated into more heavily fortified positions. Zhou's offer was that both sides would disengage and withdraw 12 miles from their current position, that China and India not cross lines of present control in Aksai Chin, and that China also retreat north of the McMahon Line in the east. Nehru replied three days later, expressing interest in negotiation, but was concerned about the mutual 12-mile withdrawal after China had advanced dozens of miles in military aggression. Negotiations stalled once more, and the Indian parliament announced a national emergency to kick the invaders out, a response that the United States and United Kingdom both supported as they began shipping military aid to India. Fighting resumed on November 14th with an Indian attack on Walong that inflicted heavy casualties on the Chinese, but did not manage to dislodge them. In the west, the Chinese launched an attack on the 18th of November near Chushul. This attack, alongside another one in Gurung Hill, led to the Indians withdrawing from the area and also from the connecting Spangor Gap. Having reached its claim lines, the PLA did not advance further, and on the 19th of November, it declared a unilateral ceasefire. The Chinese went with the offer Nehru had rejected, retreating to the actual control line and returning most of Arunachal Pradesh. They also only kept a third of what they had taken in Aksai Chin, focusing on just keeping enough to protect the road they built from Xinjiang to Tibet. The ceasefire came just after the Indians had asked for American air support, and soon after, the U.S. aircraft carrier USS Kitty Hawk was ordered back and American intervention avoided. Neither side declared war, used their air force, or fully broke off diplomatic relations, but the conflict is still commonly referred to as a war. While not necessarily a large one, with only a couple thousand casualties on both sides, it did have serious repercussions. The loss pushed India to modernize its army and begin developing nuclear weapons. The war also alienated Pakistan, which, while had traditionally been a U.S. ally, saw the American aid to India as a betrayal. The end of the Sino-Indian War marked the end of India's forward policy, and the de facto borders stabilized along the line of actual control, where they remain to this day.